forms, I'm going to call this public hearing to order. And thank you all for coming out, especially on such a treacherous, uh, slushy, yucky night. Um, I'm going to just do a, a quick, I'm going to ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, and then I'll do a little framework of how this evening will be run. Uh, there will be a brief presentation, and then the most important thing is hearing from all of you. So why don't we start on um, this side of Madam President. Hi, I'm Tatiana Valentine. I'm president of the Somerville Board of Aldermen, and I'm the representative from the board on the school committee and also the Ward 7 Aldermen. Andre Green, Ward 4. I'm Carrie Norman, Ward 7, and chair of the school committee this year. I'm Dan Control, Ward 2, uh, chair of finance uh, this year. Paula Sullivan, Ward 6, and also the chair of the Ed Programs and Instruction Committee. So we have interpreters in the, the raise your hands. There you go. Oh, thank you. Um, if anyone needs interpretation, uh, raise your hand. Okay. So maybe we might point that out again later in the evening if more people show up. Uh, so the way that the, the mechanics of the evening, there's a sign up sheet. You need to sign in. We'll go in the order of people if they signed in. You'll get three minutes to speak. Um, if you have longer comments or you also want to send them in in writing, we'd love that. Uh, we really want to hear from as many people in as many different ways. So we have tonight's public hearing. We have a second one uh, Wednesday, February 6th at 6 o'clock over on the west side at the West Somerville Neighborhood School. We are doing a slew of office hours starting this Saturday. It's a school committee across the city. Uh, don't feel like you need to go to the one. If, if you can't make it to your representatives, go to any of them. We need as much feedback as we can get. Uh, you can contact any of us directly, either by phone, email. Um, flag us down at the park, however, whatever works for you. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's it. Um, the only thing I'd like to say before I turn it over to the superintendent is the school committee makes this decision based, putting it in the context of the entire district. So we need to look at uh, what is innovation Bring, what does the school bring to the students involved, the students enrolled there, what would it bring to students across the district, what are the resources, whether it's uh, staff, financial, just, uh, uh, I'm going to take a breath because I literally ran two blocks to get here, <laughs> got my cardio in, uh, what those resources are district-wide, so it's, it's, it's looking both taking a very close eye at the, the school, the Powderhouse Studio School, but it's also putting it in the context of um, what's going on at our high school, what's, it, what's going on at Next Way Full Circle, putting it in the context of the whole district. And we are kicking off with an equity initiative. It's got three prongs. Um, very exciting, but that is the lens that we will be looking at all decisions going forward in the district. Large ones, small ones, all of them. So, I think that kind of covers it. Superintendent, do you want to take over? I'm going to actually walk this way with it so we can put it back. Um, so first of all, welcome to everyone. We really appreciate everyone coming out tonight for what is an exciting concept. Um, the Powderhouse School as... Certainly. Thanks. Thank you, Owen. Um, current Summerville High School student who's helping us out tonight. So, exactly. Uh, so this is a concept uh, that began as what was used to be referred to as STEAM Academy and has morphed into Powerhouse Studios. And when I came on as superintendent, it was something that had been for several years discussed and had been work being worked on. Uh, what you will find, in a, and I think we all appreciate in the design, is that there's a lot of out-of-box thinking and innovation. And that one of the things in innovation schools and the reason that they were created is not to be standalone innovation, but to have that innovation, have the option to help transform and bring those ideas into the broader system. And that is some of what excites us about Powderhouse and its concept. That said, there's two key areas. Um, I think you know that Powderhouse received a $10 million grant from XQ, um, and we certainly congratulate them for that. Um, I do want to be clear that that was given to Powderhouse as a potential district school. We are still working on the financial model for the school, and we are also still working on the enrollment algorithm. So those are two areas that 
this evening, we won't be addressing question, uh, any kinds of comments or questions. You certainly can make comments about them, but we won't be addressing because we're still negotiating in those areas. Um, so that's it. I'd like to welcome Shonalyn Duffy from the Potter House team to come forward and to share with you some exciting concepts about the school, and then we'll look forward to being able to hear the comments. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here tonight. You've gotten a few thank yous already. Um, if someone who knows how to set up this computer could help assist me with this image, that would be really great. Um, Great, technical difficulties just to start the night out of the way. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I both really appreciate your time, um, your openness to hearing more about, um, about this proposal and bringing your own comments, um, questions, concerns into the mix. Um, we feel really grateful to um, be entering and now into the process, uh, part of the approval process for um, Powderhouse Studios, this new innovation school um, that is now finally getting out like into public conversation. Um, so that's something we're really grateful for. Um, and just before I dig into the kind of design overview that we're gonna share tonight, um, just to speak from a personal place, um, I'm, I feel really grateful um, as someone who was born in Somerville, my mom's from Somerville, her parents are from Somerville. This is a place that I feel deeply connected to. It's my home. Um, it's the place that I plan to live and work um, for a very long time, no matter, uh, no matter what happens with uh, Powderhouse Studios, the school. Um, and so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be a part of um, just being in this conversation with all of you um, about a city that I love and I know that we all really love. Um, so thanks for that. Um, just to give a preview of what I'm gonna share, Chair Norman already um, gave an overview of the night. Um, I wanna talk, uh, I'm gonna give an overview of the Powderhouse design, just kind of at, uh, at a high level um, and I'm kind of assuming that we have some people who, uh, everyone here has heard of Powder House because you showed up, um, but some people who have been following what's been happening with it since back in 2012 when the idea was first kind of coming to fruition or coming into existence. Um, and some of you might have heard about it pretty recently. Um, and so I'm hoping I'll pr be providing more detail to people who have heard about it for a long time, but also enough of a structure to get people up to speed. So I wanna start with just what is the big idea behind Powder House? Um, and to put it really simply, we want to create a space where young people um, get to engage in doing real work in the real world um, as often and as much as possible. Um, and we're looking to two are like areas in the world for inspiration about that. Um, one of them is the place that I think all great schools look, which is in including the Somerville schools, which is what are best practices in education? What does it look like to really support youth, the growth and development of youth um, in a real way? Um, and the other one, which is unique to Powderhouse, um, is what does it look like in creative workplaces out in the real world um, where people are doing um, hands-on work, solving real problems, um, and bringing projects to life. And so kind of at the intersection of those two places is where we see the design of Powderhouse being situated. Um, and out of that big idea, out of that intersection, we see kind of four design, main design elements that come out of it. Um, the first one is our curricular focuses as a school, which are going to be computation, narrative, and design. Um, so when we talk about computation, we mean things around like digital literacy and computer science. Um, when we talk about narrative, we're talking about storytelling, communication, um, uh, rhetoric, persuasive, writing, and speaking. Um, and when we talk about design, we're talking about solving problems in the real world with a real audience in mind. Um, and we're focusing on those things not because we think all youth at Powder House should be computer scientists or journalists or product designers, but because we think those skills really cut across disciplines. So no matter what young people want to do after they leave Powder House, they'll be equipped with a set of skills and fluencies that are going to serve them um, no matter where they go. Um, the second, so that's sort of what people will be doing at Powder House. Um, and another thing that falls out of that big idea, that intersection, is kind of where people will be doing it. Um, and something that's really central to our design 
is building a learning community that's small, um, intimate, um, that where people are sticking with a small cohort of like 30 to 40 youth um, with a few teachers that stick with them year over year. Um, so that's the kind of like size and shape of learning community that we're, we're proposing. Um, to kind of zoom into that community, um, we are also really focused on uh, being aware that young people are going to come to us at all different places when they come into the school. So some are going to have experience doing projects either in school or out of school, some not. Um, but we know that self-management and self-efficacy are things that have to be taught explicitly. Um, that we can't just assume that someone comes in with them or that they'll develop them along the way. That we need to name them and tackle those skills the same way we would t tackle a math skill or a, or a writing skill or any other kind of skill. Um, and the last piece is that we're designing, designing the school around a competency-based progression towards graduation. Um, and so the, one of the main tools we'll be using at Parter House to do that is what we're calling an individualized learning plan, um, where project-based work that youth do um, will be connected back to uh, personal and professional goals that youth and families kind of set together with the Parter House team. Um, as well as traditional academic standards um, and any other goals they might have um, for themselves. And that'll be the tool we use to kind of manage people's progress towards graduation. Um, and so while the, the specific model for Parter House that we are proposing hasn't been done in its full form somewhere, many of the pieces have been done. Um, and they've been done to great success by schools in different places around the country. Um, and we've been um, lucky in the past years of developing this proposal of both working collaboratively with school leaders from some of these schools as well as doing um, like observations and visits and um, being able to share materials and tools um, with some of these schools but I just want to pull out a few models that we've been really inspired by and that we're kind of building um, building powder houses design on top of. Um, so one uh, is High Tech High which is based out of San Diego um, a school that really um, dug into what does it look like to do team teaching and specifically what does it look like to do team teaching to support project-based learning um, with high schoolers. Uh, the second one being Generation Schools, a, a consortium of schools that have really uh, done a lot of work thinking about what does individualized um, and flexible scheduling look like with students and staff. Um, the Harlem Children's Zone is uh, both a school but much more than a school in Harlem um, that has done a lot of work designing what it looks like to be truly integrated as a school into the community that you're in um, and organizing youth in a kind of case management model. And then the Coalition of Essential Schools is another project-based school where youth do divergent work, um, so they're not necessarily all doing the same thing and have developed a really rigorous and deep um, workshopping and critique system for how projects are tackled that we're um, building our critique and assessment projects on top of. Um, and so we're really excited at the possibility um, that Somerville can kind of join, join in with these schools and starting to bring these innovations into the district. Um, and some of that is already happening. So we're also really excited to kind of join in an innovation district with the Winter Hill Community Innovation School who's already using some of the autonomies granted by the innovation schools legislation um, to make changes in their school for their youth and families. Um, and just because we've been talking about innovation schools um, a bit tonight, I want to take a second to just describe what the innovation school legislation is and how it works. Um, the kind of like, uh, my quick understanding of where the legislation came from was basically um, in response to a desire for um, public districts to be able to get autonomy and flexibility in how they operate their schools from the state uh, without needing to do things like charters and things like that. So the idea is to create in-district schools um, that have the ability to um, make changes to how they work and to operate differently from how other schools in the district might. Um, and at Potter has it, that's really important to us because we, we don't want to be a school that serves just the families that attend our school. We want to be a part of a school system, um, a part of a school system that serves the entire community that it is a part of. Um, 
and of the Somerville community. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly describe what the innovation school process is like and kind of where we are in that process. Um, so kind of the first step is that an innovation plan committee gets formed and that committee includes parents and teachers. Um, it can include school um, representatives from existing um, district schools, members of community organizations throughout the, the district that you're in, um, as well as others. And that committee is tasked with coming up with a design for the school, uh, drafting a design um, in the form of an innovation plan. And so the innovation plan is the document that the school committee will choose to approve or not in authorizing um, Powder House as an innovation school. Um, and depending on what the contents of that innovation plan are, um, the school might request autonomies from the state about how they operate. Um, so from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, they might request autonomies from their local um, teachers union around uh, staffing concerns in the new school. Um, and they request autonomies from district policies um, with the school committee, who is ultimately both the oversight um, body for the school in terms of governance um, and the authorizer. So uh, they're both approving autonomies but also deciding whether the school comes into existence at all. Um, and if that does happen, then the school becomes a new like, in-district innovation school. And that's, we're sort of at, uh, right now all together, um, a part of that process um, during that school committee deliberation approval um, process. Um, and so if Powder House is going to be an in-district innovation school in Somerville, um, one of the first questions we have to ask is, how does Powder House fit into Somerville? Um, and I think the first answer that we have um, feels easy. And a part of it, and in large part, that's because Somerville has a history of developing really excellent programming to meet the needs of, of its community. So whether it's programs like UNIDOS or the CTE program at the high school scale, um, Next Wave Full Circle, um, these programs were all designed to meet like the diverse needs of a di diverse community. Um, and it's something that Somerville has a real track record of doing. And we're hoping that Powder House can be um, kind of an addition to the ecosystem of things that Somerville is able to offer youth and families. Um, the second thing, we're, if we do things right, we really hope that we'll be able to bring um, back uh, some families who have decided to go out of district, whether into charters and independent schools um, or in outplacements. Um, we also, I mentioned the innovation district idea um, that uh, kind of started with Winter Hill and, and we hope that Powder House can be a part of expanding. Um, and we see a real opportunity for um, creating um, in-house, in Powder House and in collaboration with the district, um, both professional development and curriculum opportunities to share out throughout the district. Um, and I think one of the opportunities that we see that coming together around in particular is because of our focus on computation, narrative, and design, um, there's a lot of work um, that we see in developing professional development experiences around uh, digital literacy and computer science, which are a new set of standards that were developed in Massachusetts a few years back. Um, and so there's the question of how does, Summer, how does Powder House fit into uh, the Somerville Public Schools as a district, and then there's also how does Powder House fit into Somerville as a community. Um, and in particular, like who's going to attend Powder House, what youth and families um, will be at the school. Um, and we think about that at two levels. So one is um, kind of at the level of the student body more generally, um, and one is at the individual level, like uh, for a particular student who would be a good fit for this kind of environment. Um, so statistically speaking, we're talking about enrolling a thir a 30 to 40 youth each year um, in a mixed age cohort, age 13 to 15, um, and with a commitment to making sure that each cohort is representative of the Somerville High School student body. And on an individual level, we think that Powder House would be a really great fit for young people who share, who have two qualities. Um, either being, uh, being someone who would benefit from being in a small, kind of tightly knit learning community, um, or if they're someone who would benefit from spending more of their time in school doing hands-on projects of their own design. And we think if those two things are true for someone, that Somerville, uh, that Powder House would be a good fit for them. And 
what's important to us about this tying back to the equity um, uh, concerns, kind of thinking about the student body as a whole, is that we think the young people for whom these two things are true really cut across demographics in the district. Young people who would benefit from a small environment or from hands-on work aren't a particular type of youth and don't come from a particular type of background. Um, so if we're gonna be doing work that looks pretty different, we're also gonna need to organize people differently to support that work. Um, so to talk a little about the staff structure, um, there's, we're gonna have a 30 to 40 person um, cohort of mixed age youth and along with each cohort, there'll be three core staff um, who move with that cohort each year, um, kind of creating that, that intimate community that we were talking about. And those staff will have three areas of responsibility. Um, one will be uh, around doing, uh, supporting project management. Um, so keeping track of the projects that youth in their cohort are doing, making sure that they're um, that they're deep, that they're rigorous, um, and that they're on, on track with those projects. One is program design, so someone kind of thinking about curriculum development, um, and one is a youth advocate, so someone who's taking the social and emotional and specifically like the non-academic concerns that a young person comes to school with um, and bringing them into the work of the school. So that's one cohort, is 30 to 40 youth and three staff. For every two cohorts, we'll have two additional staff, a computation-focused and narrative-focused lead whose work is to kind of enrich the work that's happening at Powder House, both um, by supporting staff and directly working with youth um, in those areas in terms of computation and, and narrative. Um, and then at a school level, we'll, um, we'll also be having um, both appropriately licensed and like the appropriate number of special education and English language learning um, licensed staff to support the needs of the student body that um, we wind up enrolling um, should we open. Um, so that's what people will look like at Powder House. Um, and this is a little bit about what work will look like. So people are gonna be working on projects of their own design. But at, as we talked about before, young people are gonna come in at all different places when they first enter Powder House. Um, and for some people, that might mean that they're ready to spend a day working on a project when they join us, but for others, it might be 20 minutes that they can manage their own time. Um, and so when people first join us, they'll be um, in facilitated seminars uh, that staff design and guide um, to support them in doing, pro doing projects of, of their own, and as they grow in their ability to manage themselves and their work, um, they'll take on more and more management of, of their time and work um, and begin doing independent projects as well as going outside the school for um, experiences the, in the community um, and other types of learning experiences. Um, something else that will look really different um, is the schedule of Powder House. So our day will be uh, 10 to 5 p.m. Um, with uh, available morning time before that um, should families need or want to take advantage of it. Um, and we'll also be operating on a year-round schedule um, where families and staff will be in communication about scheduling individualized and flexible um, vacations around um, needs families have around travel um, or making opportunities for youth who have younger siblings in um, other SPS schools, for instance, to have a full vacation together or, or to have summer experiences together. Um, and so that's kind of at a high level, the, the design overview that I wanted to give tonight, and I wanted to quickly just pull out um, from that a few of the autonomies um, that we're requesting from the school committee um, as, a part of that, um, as a part of that design. And so they're in kind of four buckets. One of them is around curriculum, one is around budget policies and procedures, um, one is schedule and calendar, um, and the other one is uh, staffing and professional development. Uh, so around curriculum, um, given what I've described around projects, um, we're specifically looking for the space to develop a competency-based progression uh, towards graduation um, and to uh, develop an indiv that individualized learning plan process to support um, young people doing self-directed work, um, having staff develop programs, projects, and other types of experiences to support those interests. 
um, and then making sure that they're mapped back rigorously um, towards those, um, those personal and professional goals, towards the things they need to graduate, um, and having where they're at inform in kind of a cyclic way what staff then set up as the next projects, programs, and et cetera um, that they take on, both as an individual and for their cohort. Um, around schedule and calendar, the requests that we're making, I think, are a little more straightforward. We want to have a different day-long schedule and a different year-long schedule. Um, and so we're asking for that relief should the school be approved. Um, we uh, just finished negotiating with the Somerville Teachers Association a bunch of staffing um, concerns. And we're also looking um, to have some flexibility around designing new professional development experiences for our staff, specifically around um, computation, narrative, and design, deepening that, as well as um, what it looks like to support project-based environments um, where young people are really doing different things in the same space. Um, and the last thing, uh, there's a lot of, uh, as Mary described, there's, uh, as Superintendent Skipper, I'm sorry, um, described, there's a, uh, a lot of moving pieces when you think about either designing a single school or looking at a school system. Um, and so the main thing that I wanted to pull out in this slide um, was this idea of a district integration working group um, that we've begun working directly with the district already to think about how these things are gonna get operationalized. But we also imagine that working group being a part of making sure that Powder House is kind of like staying connected with and really interleaved with the functioning of the of the district um, and things are working smoothly in an ongoing way as it transitions into existence. Um, and so that's, that's sort of where we are in the process. Those are the autonomies that we're um, requesting. Uh, thank you all again for, for being here. I'm really looking forward to um, hearing the things you wanna share. Um, and I just wanted to have this slide up. Um, I'm sure that these will also get announced, but there's other public hearings and school committee meetings coming up where you can hear more um, and share more about this proposal coming up. Um, and I also just want to name that both school committee members are holding office hours as um, Chair Norman described, and that the Powder House team is doing the same, both at daytimes and evenings. So there's a lot of people in this room who are available in the coming weeks to answer questions and have conversations about this proposal. So thank you very much. Thank you for that for our presentation and for your remarks, Superintendent Skipper. We are going to move over move to the question, not the question, the common part. So the way that a public hearing works is our job as school committee is to listen. We won't be responding. We won't be answering questions, um, listening very hard. If there are follow-up questions that you want uh, answers to, we will be recording them. They will be going into the Q&A. Um, I don't know if staff will be available after the hearing. Okay, great. Um, I know school committee, we've submitted an extensive number of questions in writing, and also we've asked a bunch at the last school committee meeting, um, and we are forever generating more questions around finances, staffing, curriculum. So do, please come to school committee meetings. You can always come to the public comment uh, at the beginning of each meeting but also just keep generating questions. It's, um, it's a really important decision, and, and it, we want as much input as possible. So uh, first, does anyone need interpretation? Okay, we do have that available. Um, so you will come up, you will get three minutes, and I... Uh, Si alguien quiere interpretar en español, o en portugués, oh, thank you. portugués, español, other languages, I don't speak. Yes, Haitian Creole. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. I appreciate that. We're team effort here. Um, so it will be three minutes, and our first speaker tonight is Greg Nadeau. And then after that is Steve Stefano. I'll try to give you an idea, a person or two heads up. Hello. 
So the year is 2019. We do not need an alternative school for some kids. The world our kids will live their lives in is fundamentally different than the one that Horace Mann lived in when he created our current system. The recent Globe series on Boston Public School valedictorians demonstrates how hard it is for traditional academic environments to break the cycle of poverty and how much more we need to do to fully support the transition of young people to self-reliance. The basic design proposed by Powderhouse Studios is not just appropriate to a small niche of students. The ideas of applied, project-based, personalized, competency-based learning apply to all students of all abilities and backgrounds. My older son, Max, who's an especially strong academic student, still struggles with the ambiguous expectations of his internship at City Hall. My younger son, Charlie, has benefited tremendously from his learner experience last year at Newview, and with his, and, which is similar to Powderhouse Studio, and his work-based experience in his current job at Redbones. The transition from the old industrial model, seat time, letter grades, and standalone subjects, to a new model that will prepare all students for their future is extremely challenging for any public school system. I applaud the work of the school district, accessing grant funds from Bar Foundation and Nellie May to create a foundation for this change. We must redouble our effort to see these changes begin in months, not years, before more of our kids are left behind. A $10 million grant from XQ to create a laboratory to develop these changes uh, may be incorporated by the entire system as an exceptional opportunity, if and only if the grant brings new resources to the system and does not siphon resources from the rest of the system. I urge the school committee to approve the Powder Studio Innovation School with the following conditions. Number one, no net uh, public school funds are used to operate the school for the first three years while the grant is in effect. $10 million is more than enough to operate a school of the proposed size as it grows for the first three years. Number two, no commitment beyond three years is made to operate the school at a separate site after the grant if enrollment does not justify capacity beyond, beyond the $250 million new high school and whatever K configuration in place. And number three, ensure that Powder Studios is established as a lab to bring back innovation to this district, not as a separate alternative program for some kids. Enable students and staff to rotate with, with Powderhouse Studios rather than be separate. Authorize the superintendent to appoint a co-director with deep public school experience and a broad-based board of trustees to help bridge between Powderhouse Studios and Sarville High School. This decision as to whether to open the Powderhouse Studios as an innovation school is 100% up to the school committee, not XQ. The conditions I suggest will ensure that Powderhouse Studios, if it is opened, benefits the entire system and does not strain district financial resources and attention from the work the district needs to be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in under three minutes. Beautifully done. Uh, so we Steve Stefano, and then third will be David. <coughs> yes. And then Paula Vignelli, I think. All right. OK. Um, I'm Steve Stefano. I've taught at the Healy School for 19 years. Um, for the last three years, I've worked with the folks from Out Out Studios. So I'm going to just speak from my experience, and that is that they're an incredible group of educators. Um, they are really fun to work with. They work incredibly hard. They work one-on-one -on -one with each of the students. It's not just uh, it's not just talk. They actually do it. Every day after school, we would have uh, half to many, most of our kids working with them after school in addition to the regular time without any request for the students to come. They wanted to keep working on their projects. Um, they have a real, and I would say, um, they understand the essence of differentiated instruction. And they really differentiate for each individual student. And you can see it when you walk through, well, you walk through my classroom when they were working with them, and you can see it after school. Um, the kids, <laughs> as, as uh, our school system doesn't meet every single need, and these met some needs much further than I could possibly offer the students in my class. And a number of the kids who are very difficult uh, to motivate, uh, needed no, motiva no motivation to work with these guys. So they've done a great job. So I guess part of what I want is, since I've worked with them for three years, is to ask you guys, the school committee, to find me and ask any questions that you have about working with these folks and what they can do for kids. Um, just on a more global level, I think the more choices that kids have, the better it is for the kids. The more choices that families have, 
the better it is for all of the families uh, in Somerville. Uh, this program is on the cutting edge. They understand what it means to push kids to do things that they wouldn't normally do in the regular classroom. They are preparing them for the real world of working with uh, people, which I don't think schools in general do. Um, I think that that's about it. Come find me. I work at the Healy School. I love these guys. They've done a great job. And I urge you and all of us to make sure that this school opens. Uh, so next is Dave. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to say my name. So um, <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Superintendent. And I don't actually know what the honorific is for school board members. Like awesome people. Is there something I should? <laughs> I, I just I really don't know what to, how to how to address you. But, yeah, but awesome. I really appreciate uh, everybody who's here, laptops included, to 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 chat to hear this. So um, just to give you an idea why I'm standing up here, my son has been in the public school system since kindergarten. Um, he's currently in seventh grade, he's 12, and I have been very, very, very proud to have him in a school system that uh, values the things that it values and the things that you folks as school committee members have made possible. And so I have a tremendous appreciation that this is the least I can do. I know that you have a really hard decision to have you, and my fond hope is that I can say something that might assist you in that decision, um, your way of thinking about it, so you can hear the way I've been thinking about it and what was convincing to me. Um, I'm going to do exactly what was suggested, which is stick to its effects on the district, not just the effects on my child. Though I would, you know, just lay all my cards on the table, I feel this would have tremendously uh, beneficial effects for my for my son. Uh, and but we'll talk about that perhaps not, you know, perhaps later if you want to hear. So the things that I appreciate is that the proposal here seems to be right in the tradition of Somerville's. Ability to find the things that are inclusive, to find the things that are innovative, that expand out the range of things to provide students what they need. This reminds me of the same sort of things that we did with Unidos, where we said that, hey, instead of taking money and, and saying, oh, here's a, here's a bunch of money, let's put it into the whole school system and make sure that we do that, that there was a, there was a recognition that if you start in a place and you can concentrate some of the effort in that place, you can often get more bang for your buck than diffusing it through a school system. It's especially true in a school system that um, works really well in general for most students. And for those students where it, th those particular structures make it hard to individualize in that particular way, and I've seen some of that because my, my son also has been sort of one of the special, has, has had special ed help, IEP, and sort of help like that. I have seen that, that sort of the more bang for the buck can come from this than sort of diffusing it through the system. Um, and so what I, what I really appreciate about this is that opportunity to create an incubator that will provide sort of not only to the people in the school but to the entire school system uh, the opportunity to have this sort of uh, back and forth that improves the entire school system in addition to just this, this, this cohort. So um, I wanted to say that I, I appreciate the fact that you're, that you're thinking about this. I appreciate the fact that you're going to do it in the way that is most efficient. The use of this money, there's certainly a way in my mind that's most efficient. Um, I appreciate uh, that you're continuing this tradition that makes me proud to have my son part of this school system. So I want to thank you for your time, and I really appreciate all the effort you're putting into to listen to people like myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask people, and I should have done this beginning, to uh, identify yourself when you come to the mic, and I apologize for any mispronunciations with my aging eyes, even with reading glasses, I'm not doing so well today. So next up is Paula Manelli. And then Lindsay Sudbury. Hello, uh, I'm Paula Manieri. I'm the uh, treasurer of the PTA here at uh, East Somerville. Uh, and I'm also a part of it here in the ministry. And um, so I emailed the the board with uh, the committee with my comments and just I want to make a couple of points. Um, I well I don't want I'm going to say the main thing you there's a lot of talk about inclusivity with this uh, program and I'm saying this as a Latino person 
I think that there's only one other person here maybe, it doesn't feel inclusive. And uh, I would say, if you want this to be inclusive, the proposal should be also written in Spanish. How parents can comment on this without having access to knowing what this is. So it feels a little excluding in tone. I, I know that in spirit is not. But uh, if this moves forward, please don't make the mistakes of becoming something very exclusive, very clicky, very... When I read the comments, I, again, I'm not saying it offensively, but I said, for white kids. That's the feeling. I know it's not, but I just want to transmit you that. And um, so, and another concern is the cost. I mean, this is, there's no information to be found so far, and I know you're still working on it, but I think that to, for parents or for, you know, the people of Somerville to make a decision or to be supportive or not of this as a full independent school, it will be nice to see where the money is going to come from. Are we cutting others, other programs? Are we cutting innovation in our schools? Actually, the first thought I had when I read it is like, but we innovate in all schools every day. I wish I had, as a PT officer, the latitude, the teachers would like that freedom to be able to procure uh, contractors, services. I mean, we pay crazy money to Easter bags to take our kids to the aquarium. It's a, you know, it's a rip-off. I wish I don't have to deal with them, but I do. So I feel like Maybe a consideration whether this program and the pro some of the proposals, which are great, instead of being a full independent thing, could they be folded into the next way, which is serving somehow the same population? Can we bring this into the high school and be a program within the high school, like Unidos is a program within this school? Um, do we really need to make this a separate entity? And I think that those are some considerations. So, uh, and the rest. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for submitting your letter. Um, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Lindsay Sutter, and then Aaron Hemingway. Hello. Thank you for providing this opportunity. All, all of the conversation so far has been amazing, so thank you to those of you who prepared so well. I did not prepare well. I didn't find out about this until yesterday. Um, but I did just want to come and say a few things. Uh, particularly, I, there's a lot of question around cost, where the funding is coming from. I know the answers are not there yet, um, and I know that the, 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 the project has been submitted, and it's evolving. Um, I, the decision's going to be made in March, and I feel like time is ticking. And <laughs> so I just, I, I hope those questions get answered. Um, and, and in particular, I, I hear that, like, oh, the, the founders need to answer this question. Um, but I also wanted to ask the school board, like, you all have the experience and know the, the, the funding in a way that the, the conversations that I've seen online, I, there's a lot of questions. So I would like to just ask that, if there is a way that that you know you see to make this happen in a way that doesn't impact some of schools, that you really do work with the founders because you all have such knowledge, um, and you know the people that have spoken that have been involved as well. I only have a kindergartner here <laughs> at Argentiano, and I'm really hoping that you know this program exists for her and further that um, the work that this program is doing can be brought back into the schools. That said, it is I think very important for. Uh, projects that really kind of flip the, the traditional model of schooling on its head to have space to develop as a separate entity. Um, so I do hope that it's given that opportunity. Um, Project-based learning is so key for the reasons that you know you all, all mentioned and um, whoever was talking about Horace Mann and traditional education. That's all the stuff that I wanted to say, but I, I just am not prepared to talk about it. 
um, at the moment. The, the idea of equity, I think equity of options is really important, and I think this, that um, you know, the school committee, like if you're seeing inequity in outcomes, that is very important, and I, I love that, that that is a theme, they're gonna be using it to make big and small decisions, but you know, universal access to education doesn't mean that all education has to look universally the same. So I do, um, you know, the idea of different minds meaning different education. How are we out of time? I'm yeah, done. Okay, okay. Um, I think, I think that's, I think that's about it. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Aaron Hemingway and then uh, Edison Alvarez Morales. If anyone else has come in and wants to sign up, you can still sign up. Hi, my name is Erin Hemingway. I do not have prepared comments. <laughs> Mostly questions that I've been jotting down since I got the email. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me in the email from the district about this hearing was, 10 to 5 sounds great, except most every musical activity, both in district and specialized out of district, happened in the afternoon. So as a, as a mom of two kids, one who's 13 and would be in the target group, and one who's 10, you're precluding the ability to do anything that's not STEM, and join youth of their own age in targeted musical activities, I believe, based on the schedule. And also sports, middle school sports and high school sports are all after school. How would kids be able to be whole students, whole children, um, outside of project-based learning with a schedule? Um, gr granted, I'm sure there's flexibility built in, but that's the question I have right now. Um, for a lottery, I know you're still working on it, would you start with a gender, 20 of each? Would you say how you identify, and you're gonna take 20 of each ad identification? So right now you're splitting 40 into 20 and 20. Um, are you gonna ensure it's Somerville residence only, proof of residency, I hope so. <laughs> um, is there a chance every year, since that's really probably 20 boys and 20 girls, will a child who's tried the first year and didn't get in, will they get equal chance second and third year? Um, is there thought to preference for younger siblings because the idea of spreading two or three kids all over the school system with multiple schedules, I only have two, but that, that freaks me out. Um, I assume MCAS will be covered somehow. And I'm losing my train of thought, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, the weighted lottery. You, the, the presenter spoke about um, finding the right fit. How are you going to have a lottery where you find the right fit? A lottery is a lottery. You pick names out of a hat. How are you going to ensure those 40 kids in the cohort fit, unless it's a straight lottery? Um, those are pretty much my questions. I'm sure I'll have more, but I'll probably come to the other hearing too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Edison, Alvarez Morales, then Alex Perry, and then Stephanie Hirsch. Um, so I'm a beneficiary of DACA, uh, most of the immigrant community, obviously. Uh, I think that the ELL program or ESL in my time in the, in the Somerville community, in the Somerville High School is really good. So I think the, the opportunity for school choice at the high school level is uh, very important, especially with the diverse programs and the way you can go about it. In this particular case, it's great. <coughs> So before uh, moving to Somerville, I live in a very diverse community uh, where I also went to high school and graduated. The population reflected in the high school, um, which is about 1,300 students, like Somerville High. Uh, it had really good English uh, programs for second language students, uh, which I take fully advantage of during my uh, experience in terms of school. Uh, projects that were more based on, the teachers were more like mentors, were far more beneficial for my growth in terms of uh, the development of skills that perhaps transfer into uh, the real world. So I think this is very beneficial for immigrants, for people who struggle uh, in terms of the stereotypical of education. Usually my classes were about 90 minutes per class, and it was four classes during the day, only, uh, only 
three of them were permanent, while the other ones were uh, rotated, so it was 45 minutes. Also, uh, I really wish uh, an uh, option like Potter House was in, it was uh, sort of part of the community or program, because I think it, it's extremely beneficial to have those skills to go into the world and apply them and perhaps instead of going into having two jobs in order to sustain yourself in particular different communities, you can just go into uh, uh, more, how can I say this, a more precise, more project oriented that you discover that you enjoy and you learn to specialize and perhaps uh, have a better income as, uh, as a graduate or an adult. Um, as a taxpayer, I do want to voice my approval on Powder House and uh, I wish the best for our, my fellow immigrants as well as uh, the school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alex Peary <coughs> and Stephanie Hirsch. And if anyone else would like to speak, by all means, set, you can sign up. Uh, <coughs> So I'm speaking in total support of the Powder House Studios. I've been enthusiastically following this project and was delighted to hear about the strong support from the Somerville Teachers Association. I'm speaking both as a former educator and a parent who has shepherded four children through a variety of learning situations in the local area. Public schools, including an alternative high school in Cambridge and Somerville, parochial schools in Cambridge and Waltham, and private schools in Cambridge and Boston. Uh, I've been around the block. <laughs> Clearly, having watched this project develop over the last few years, the components and the overall structure have been thought through and whenever, wherever possible, tested. This is not some wild-eyed launch into the unknown, but a carefully prepared, innovative development that will make some of them proud and put it in the forefront of education. Many years ago, when I first moved to Somerville, I was door-knocked by a school committee person looking for my vote. I explained that at the time, this was 40 years ago, I had a child in her final year at the CRLS pilot school and she'd be graduating from there. But while I have your attention, I said, I've heard that the Somerville schools have problems. Well, the committee person said, I went to the Somerville schools. I realized this was not a discussion that was going anywhere. Later, with a new and growing family, I became involved with the schools and I remember brainstorming with Mark Niedergang a set of goals around the dream of a school district that cherished both excellence and equity. This was at a time when, around the block, schools were still referred to as Fortress Somerville. I'm happy to say that the walls of the fortress were long ago breached. <clears throat> Two superintendents and several progressive and thoughtful school committees later, we are continuing to grow and provide the kinds of innovative educational programming in schools that our children, and especially, yes, that long ago school committee person deserved. I'm sure that that person, not to mention my children, would have been deeply satisfied and thoroughly stimulated by the education provided by the Powderhouse Schools model. Thanks, Alec Resnick and team. Thank you. We have Stephanie, and then we have um, Marcella Brown's here, and if anyone else would like to speak, by all means, you're welcome to. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Stephanie Hirsch, and I'm here speaking as a parent of three children at the Argentiana School in grades 1st, 5th, and 7th. Um, I'm appreciative of everybody being here in the discussion, um, but I'm mainly here to express concerns and worries about the future of the district and um, the kids that I know. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned that we're having this conversation without a sense of the long-term cost of the of the school and how it will impact our district budget um, and whether or not we will need to um, make cuts in other key programs or table initiatives that I believe we really need. Um, based on um, my understanding of the finances, it could receive up to $3.2 million per year from the district's budget. And for context, this is more than three times our recreations budget, six times the budget of the Family Learning Collaborative, and much bigger than our entire city library budget. If I have that cost right, the new school will use up any growth in the district budget for years to come, requiring cuts or limiting investment in other initiatives. 
Um, given the, um, that cost, if that cost is correct, it's not clear to me that the proposal addresses our district's biggest problems like the significant achievement gap, need for social emotional wraparound supports and coordination. Um, the presentation mentions that the school adds to Somerville's menu of options, but in adding an option, I'm concerned that it also means taking away options for our school district. Um, and to me, it represents a key strategic shift away from and potentially disinvestment in integrated universal schools like our neighborhood schools. Um, and I believe our current schools already need more help, so don't, shouldn't have more cuts. For a specific example, and speaking as a parent, my daughter's in the seventh grade at the Argenziano, and the school has not had a science teacher for all of January. She has had three or four different Spanish teachers since last year. There are not enough supports for kids with behavioral and mental health issues and virtually no after-school programming for sixth graders or low-income children in the lower grades. If this proposal passes, for example, there may be about 10 children in seventh and eighth grade who transfer to the school. The tuition follows those 10 children, so $200,000 would be directed to the school just as a charter school works. It's not possible to close two middle grade sections at the Argenziano, so the district must find a way to cut $200,000 from the school budget. Where can we cut given that we know that we need more resources already? If, on the other hand, we do as a district want to spend um, two million, three million, some significant investment in innovation and hands-on learning, think about what our, each of our kids' schools could do if we had $320,000 per school to spend. We could add four staff who could organize project or place-based learning, staff Xbox periods, lead an extended day program, or help teachers strategize about projects. Um, so uh, to kind of echo um, Greg's points earlier, I hope that there is a way to resolve some of the issues I've raised. Maybe there's a way that the district and the founders can find a way for the school to be inclusive rather than a standalone school choice menu option. Maybe it could be located at the new high school so the facility cost would be less. Um, then it could also be open to all kids and teachers to experience, such as for a period per day or a quarter per year. Maybe it could be run, run in conjunction with Next Wave Full Circle, or it be explicitly designed to address the needs of one of our most vulnerable populations, More like three. overage yeah. kids. So um, I hope there is a way, a solution, but I, I do wanna, was, want us to be clear-eyed and, and think about the future and what the future impact will be. Thank you so much. Uh, Marcello Frontier is currently our last speaker. Does anyone else want to get in on this tonight? We will be having another one. Up. Oh. Hello, my name is Marcello Grossiner, and I am a lifelong Somerville resident, a uh, graduate from Somerville High School. I used to be on the, the student representative of the school committee, so a couple familiar faces. And I was Steve Stefano's student back in the day at the Healy, great teacher. Um, so I'll start with a couple minor concerns that I think can be fleshed out and solved if, we, if it's approached the right way. I do have a concern, yo soy Latino, and I am a little bit concerned about the exclusivity of the school. I think if it's done right though, it can be inclusive. Also, um, having been involved in a lot of extracurriculars at Somerville High School, I do see the 10 to 5 schedule being a slight concern. Um, and again, it was described as being a flexible schedule at the school. So I think that can be possible to work around, but that is something important to keep in mind. Um, but then looking at a lot of the positives, I think that this is a really necessary space for Somerville. Um, I can think of a lot of classmates that I had growing up who needed this space, um, a sort of uh, singular alternative approach to education that could benefit a lot of kids who don't fit that mold of your average school setting. Um, I think that kids from Somerville have a story to tell, and obviously I'm thinking more specifically about the narrative piece of the school, but I think that's a really valuable piece that a lot of, a lot of other schools don't necessarily build uh, overtly into their structure. Um, and lastly, I am thinking about the grading system that would be in place at the school. Um, I think that that's a really important piece of this design because when students are working towards a grade, they're thinking either consciously or subconsciously about how their work can get a good grade on what the teacher and the school is expecting them to do. And I think that that's really putting kids in a tight mold in terms of how they can express themselves as students, as, as individuals, and exploring their identities. Um, and so I think that that grading piece, it's important that it's done right, but that can do so much for students that isn't done in any school really that exists in the city right now. Thank you. 
Thank you, and, and our final speaker is Mark Leder again. I hope I'm not the final one. I hope somebody, some of the rest of you will also speak. I'm Mark Niedergang. I served on the school committee from 2006 through 2013, and I've been the Ward 5 alderman for the last five years. And my 26-year-old daughter went to school for nine years at the Healy and four years at Somerville High School. I think this is a fabulous idea. I've loved it since uh, Alec Resnick first presented it uh, to me and, uh, and to the school committee. I followed it very closely for the first few years. I haven't followed it so closely since then, so my comments won't be uh, as brilliant as many of yours have. But I think this is a just an incredibly far-sighted uh, and effective model for education. I think. The district will benefit in tremendous ways from what's learned in this school uh, by the teachers and by the rest of the people in the district. I understand the concerns about the cost, but since there is a $10 million grant, might as well get it started and see what happens. You know, I'm not one to say you can't start something and shut it down if, if for some reason it's not working. I say let's start it up and find a way for it to work. So I urge the school committee to figure this out, start it up, find a way to, for it to work, and, and hopefully as time goes on, some of the challenging questions that obviously exist uh, will be resolved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Well, I thank all of you for coming tonight and for speaking. Um, again, there is, it's on the district website, it's been pushed out a slew of office hours. Please feel free to talk to any of us after this or contact us directly. The uh, Powder House is on the agenda, I think, for every full school committee between now and the March 4th vote. And there will be another public hearing on the west side at West Somerville Neighborhood School on Wednesday, February 6th at 6 o'clock. So if you know folks who weren't able to come out tonight, please encourage them to come then. And thank you very much. We are. We are adjourned. Done.